talk about how does God strengthen us, and we're talking about what in uh, popular terms we call the means of grace. We're talking about how God uses certain means or instruments to get us to be stronger, just the same way that if you walk into a gym, you are going to find tools inside that gym, cardio tools called treadmills and elliptical machines and uh, resistance tools called free weights and machines, and your trainer is going to use those to get you stronger. Well, we want to talk about the things that God uses spiritually to get us stronger. So because I was thinking along those lines, I, I went on and I did a little research to get kind of inside the head of a trainer. What does someone whose whole profession and whose everyday life is built around getting us stronger physically think? How, how do they process the, the, the whole way to go about making you and me stronger physically? And I found this conversation between two trainers who are actually pretty elite level trainers, training professional athletes, and they were having a conversation around the topic of what to do when you're training a professional or, or a college athlete and you know that they are going to be in season for quite a bit of the year and you're not going to be allowed to be hands-on training them, what can you do for them to help them for the times not only that they're with you, but also when they're without you uh, in season with their coaches on their team? And they had this uh, conversation, and it, and it goes like this. We focus on the same thing we focus on with someone that we have all the time, with someone that we have a longer period of time, what we focus on is education. It's our job to make athletes informed consumers who know how to, now listen very carefully, who know how to listen to their body, adapt to their surroundings, eat the right foods, get the right amount of sleep, and do the correct programs regardless of what's going on around them. Did you catch that? I'm going to go through that again because that's critically important. This is how you get physically stronger. You are able to listen to your body, adapt to your surroundings, eat the right foods, get the right amount of sleep, and do the correct programs and I really want to emphasize this, regardless of what's going on around you. As a spiritual trainer, when I saw those words, I thought to myself, this is exactly right. Also, when we want someone to, to become spiritually stronger, I, I would just say it this way. We want to make spiritual athletes informed People who know how to listen to their spirit, adapt to their surroundings, eat the right spiritual foods, get the right amount of spiritual rest, and do the correct spiritual exercises regardless of what's going on around them. And that's what we're going to be talking about today as we talk about the means of grace because the means of grace are the tools or the instruments or the vehicles that God uses to help us become stronger. But I want to give you a warning before we dive into today's message and something that, that you need to know. I think you know me well enough by now if you've been here any length of time. I'm a person that likes to be upfront and not hide things from you. And what I'm gonna say in a very upfront way today is that I'm gonna be challenging some of your beliefs. If you are here today as an unbeliever, you're not a Christian, first of all, we warmly welcome you. We're excited that you're here. This church is built for you. But I also wanna to say to you, I'm gonna be challenging some of your beliefs with this message today. And the reason I know this is because as unbelievers, what most of us think, and I thought this too when I was an unbeliever, is that spiritual things are spiritual things, and they have their compartment and their box, and over here, physical things are physical things, and they're completely separate and completely other from the spiritual things, and the two do not mingle or mix. Well, the question I'm going to tackle today is, is that really true? 
Is that really true that spiritual and physical things do not mingle or mix or have any connection with each other? If you're a Christian and you've come to crosswalk from another tradition, I will also be challenging your beliefs today. And again, just in the interest of loving, being upfront, I want to tell you that I am going to, to challenge uh, the belief that Holy Communion, which is what we'll be talking about in this message about God strengthening us, is a sacrament in the sense, and, and often in Christian churches it's even called this, in the sense that it's an ordinance or an act of obedience on your part that you do solely in response to God's uh, love for you. That, that, that that's all it is, is a ceremony and a remembrance. It's a time when you come to reconsecrate and offer yourself up to God. And I'm going to say that I'm gonna ask you the question today, is that really true? And so I hope you're ready. Um, I already sense a little tension in the room. It's, okay. it's gonna be okay. We're not gonna have any pitched battles. I love all you guys, but I am gonna challenge beliefs today. All right, so let's dive in. And as I said, one of the ways that God strengthens us is through communion, and communion is one part of these means of grace that I have referenced before. So you can take the means of grace and you can divide them kind of into two parts. The key means of grace is the Word of God, and what we believe is that God works supernaturally through His Holy Spirit as we read, meditate on, and understand the words and the message of this book to convert hearts and transform us into believers. That's what we believe the Holy Spirit does. In other words, when you're reading the Bible, you're reading a book, but not just a normal book. This is a supernatural, spiritual book through which the Holy Spirit transforms hearts, minds, and lives. That's the key means of grace. But there are two other means of grace that we call baptism, which Pastor Dan taught us about last week. And today we're gonna to learn about the Lord's Supper, or Holy Communion, and, and God, combining earthly elements like water, bread, and wine with his word also uses these as supernatural, spiritual ways to strengthen you and to change your heart, your mind, and your life, to transform you into God's child and to transform you into Christ's image and to transform your eternal destination from hell to heaven. That God also uses baptism and the Lord's Supper just as he uses the word of God when we combine those earthly elements with the word of God. So, means of grace. Let's, let's read, and then I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about those last two, which we call a sacrament. 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 29, it's right on the top of your crosswalk notes. Please follow along with me. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves." So this is the Apostle Paul, and he's talking to a congregation in a city uh, called Corinth. It's a very large city. It's a city of a lot of commerce and trade and busy people. And Paul has brought the gospel to this city, and a Christian congregation has formed. 
And in this city and in this congregation, various issues have arisen, as always happens, because we are fallen people living in a fallen world. And one of those issues has to do with how the Corinthians are handling the Lord's Supper. And that's why we have this section. And so Paul is going to address them on this topic. Before I dive into that, I want to take you to one further definition. I've talked to you about the means of grace, these these tools or vehicles or instruments that God uses to work on our hearts. And I'm going to tell you that you can break the means of grace down into two categories. You have the main one, the Bible, but you also have these other two very important ones, baptism and the Lord's Supper, and those you might know already or you might not, we group together under a category called sacraments. Now, to understand today's message and where I'm going with the Lord's Supper, we've got to understand what we mean by a sacrament. So pull out your notes. I'm going to start by just defining what a sacrament is. What is a sacrament? And then we're going to spend the rest of the message talking about how does a sacrament strengthen me? So a sacrament is, first of all, a sacred act. And what I mean by that very quickly, because we'll dive more deeply into this in a moment, is it's a supernatural set apart moment in which God is present with us. If you look throughout the Bible and you just view different parts, the, the temple worship and all of that, you will always see that those elements are there. There's a, an element of supernatural and spiritual and God's presence. And it is set apart. In fact, sacred and holy mean the same thing, and they both mean you have to set it apart. It's not to be part of the common or the ordinary. Secondly, a sacrament is established by Christ. It is instituted by him and commanded by him. Thirdly, it uses earthly elements. You know what the earthly element is in baptism. If you were here last week, you can see it right there. It's water. In communion, the earthly element is bread and wine. And amazingly, the way God has organized and arranged things, in a sacrament, God uses earthly elements, and this is the fourth and final point, to convey heavenly blessings. It's very uh, important we understand those four points because we're going to show how the Lord's Supper is a sacrament by that definition, And that it's important to understand that for us to understand what the Lord's Supper is, why we should use it, and how it strengthens us. So let's dive in, and I'm actually going to lead you back to the top, and I want to point something out to you. We're going to not read right from the very top, verse 23, but rather go down to verse 27 with the words, so then. So find those words, so then. And I want you to just breathe in the spirit of these words as I read them again to you. So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ eat and drink judgment on themselves. Now, when you hear language like that in the Bible, which is basically in short saying, when you use the Lord's Supper, be careful because it is powerful on a spiritual level. You know that God is talking about something that is holy. And put in the context of the entire remainder of the Bible, whenever God talks like this, he talks like this about temple worship and who can approach the holy of holies. With Moses, he talked about this um, when he gave the commandments and said, don't let the people come near the mountain. It's too holy right now. Uh, They'll die if they come near. In the New Testament, because I don't want you to believe that, you know, God's holiness is only displayed in the Old Testament. It's displayed very profoundly and carefully and bluntly in the New Testament as well. There was a couple named Ananias and Sapphira. And and they were going to bring an offering that was to be set apart or holy to the Lord. And that offering was going to come from a piece of land that they had sold. And the value of that, that land, they told everyone, we have set apart the entire value sales price of that land to the Lord. It is our gift. But 
If you read carefully in the book of Acts, what you find is that Ananias and Sapphira, while they said that the entire value of their land was to be set apart to the Lord, they held back a little bit of it for themselves. And sadly, at, at the end of this story, because of that keeping for themselves what now belonged to the Lord by their own giving of it to the Lord, they end up losing their lives because it was a gift that had become holy and set apart to the Lord. So the first thing that we have to understand is that when something is holy and sacred and supernatural and spiritual in this way, that means handle with care. And that it is not to be treated as common in every day. And let me just share with you that I believe that this is an honest struggle for people of Christian faith of all ages, this difference between the common and the holy, or what we might say, the difference between the casual and the serious. Here I am, for example, up here preaching God's word to you, and I am wearing tennis shoes and an untucked shirt and jeans. And we have committed at this church to say we are a church that builds a casual atmosphere because we want people to come in here and feel comfortable on their first visit that, hey, these are just regular everyday people. And do you know why we want to convey that message? Because it's the truth. We are just common everyday people. We are sinners like everyone else. I don't stand up here because I'm someone special or different or other. I am just as sinful as anyone in this room, probably more so than many. I stand up here because of God's call, not because I'm holy. And I'm certainly not holier than thou. But while that is true, I think if you've been here at Crosswalk for any length of time, you know that while we're building a casual atmosphere that shows that we are regular, everyday sinful people, like all of you, we are also serious about our Christian faith. And honestly, walking that line between the casual and the serious, is, it requires some judgment. And it's not always an easy line to, to walk down the middle of. And, and so what people tend to do is they treat everything as serious and I'm serious and I take myself seriously and, and I certainly take my faith and I take God seriously and, and they opt for all serious all the time. Or on the flip side, they opt for <laughs> all casual and all common all the time. The beauty of that is it doesn't require much judgment, does it? It doesn't require figuring out what, what can be casual and is appropriately casual and what should be serious and holy and set apart and, and that's really what God wants it to be. And so, one of the things that you find here at Crosswalk is that though we are a casual church, there are certain things, because we believe they are sacred and holy and set apart for God, that we're very serious about God's Word. And preaching and teaching only according to God's Word without adding or subtracting anything from it. And one of those things that we are also very serious about because we believe it is a very sacred and holy and supernatural time Connecting with God is the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. You will have noticed that we don't offer the Lord's Supper in our regular everyday service like a lot of churches do. We offer it quietly after there's been a little bit of time for all of us to meet and greet our guests at 10.30 and 12.30, people who have prepared themselves for the Lord's Supper, and I'll talk more about that later on in the message, come back in because we are trying to treat God's holy things as holy things. And I want you to look at that passage again. Whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. 
You see, what this passage is saying is that not, not only do you have a responsibility as an individual Christian, but we as Christians need to have each other's back that, that we make sure that this time of Holy Communion with the Lord, where we connect with God and we connect horizontally also with each other as family, is holy to the Lord. And I'm going to talk more about our process for preparing you for the Lord's Supper in a little bit, but understand that our heart is simply to recognize what God is saying here. Goes on, everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. But what if someone doesn't know what that even means to examine yourself? Or doesn't know how to examine themselves? And then finally, look at verse 29. You know that this is a holy thing and a sacred event when it says, those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ eat and drink judgment on, myself, on themselves. Throughout the Bible, it is clear that when something is designated by God as set apart and holy, God wants his people to treat it that way. Take a look at Ezekiel 22.8. And this is something God sent his prophet Ezekiel to tell the Old Testament Jews. You have despised my holy things. And that word despise means you've treated them as common, ordinary, everyday things. They're not. They're special and set apart and supernatural and sacred, but you've despised them and you have desecrated my Sabbaths. And what does desecrate the Sabbath mean? It means treat the Sabbath like any other old, common, ordinary day. For the Old Testament Jews to whom Ezekiel was speaking, it was to treat the worship day, Saturday, like Friday, Thursday, Wednesday, Tuesday, Monday, or Sunday. No difference. Go worship God today? Nope. I have business to conduct. I need to work. I've got things to do. And Saturday, their worship day, was desecrated because it was treated as a common ordinary day. God said, no, this day is supposed to be set apart and special and holy and devoted to me. It, it's also true of this sacrament of the Lord's Supper. Paul, when he talks to the Corinthians, says, if you come to the Lord's Supper, you have to be wholeheartedly devoted. You can't walk two different lines. The, the Corinthian Christians, one of their faults was that they were trying to keep their feet in both worlds. Be savvy businessmen on the one hand and keep their foot in the, in the world of trade and business and, and doing things, which meant maybe they had to do some things that, that weren't very godly. Specifically, what it meant here is they would go with their buddies to other temples and eat meat that had been sacrificed to other idols. But they wanted to have their other foot in the Christian world. And so they straddled the fence. Look what Paul says to them. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons too. You cannot have a part in both the Lord's table and the table of demons. And what Paul would still say to us today is, when you come to the Lord's table, it is imperative that you understand what it is and how it draws on all that God and his grace and Jesus and his love for you have done for you. And be committed to not having your feet in two different worlds, but be singular in your devotion, your Holy Spirit created devotion to God. So here's what I want you to write, and we'll finish up page one. The Lord's Supper is a sacred act and we treat it that way by receiving it as Christ's true body and blood. Now, I want to take you back up to a passage. Verse 29 says, For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ eat and drink judgment on themselves. When Jesus did establish this sacrament in the upper room, he gave the bread and the wine to them, and he said these words. He said, Take and eat, this is my body. 
Take and drink, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. And what we believe here at Crosswalk is that when you receive the bread and the wine, that with that bread and wine, in a mysterious, supernatural, a a way that we can't fully explain to you, you also really and truly receive Christ's body and blood. That it is really that Christ's body and blood is supernaturally present in and with and under the bread and that Christ's blood is really and truly present in, with, and under the wine. Now, don't ask me to explain it any further than that because it's like asking me to explain the Trinity. Can I, can I explain you, to you uh, perfectly how God can be both one and three at the same time? It's a mystery. It's supernatural. It's God. But what I can tell you is the plain words of Scripture are that when Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, he said, here, this is my body, here, this is my blood, and that when Paul later references it, he comes back and he says, if you eat or drink this sacrament without discerning that you're eating and drinking the true body and blood of Christ, you may be eating and drinking judgment on yourself. Now realize this is something that sets us apart because we are saying the bread and the wine are not mere symbols. They're not mere remembrances, but that something deeper, far more supernatural and mysterious is actually going on when we come up to receive the body and blood of Christ and the bread and wine. Now, I'm going to offer right here and now, right in the middle of this sermon, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm going to say some things that are challenging enough to some of your beliefs that you may want to ask some questions. Please come up after the service. I'll be right here. I am happy to answer any questions. But I, in the interest, again, of just being very upfront, to us, the Bible clearly teaches that Christ's body and blood are really and truly present, and to receive the Lord's Supper in a worthy manner We must discern and understand that when we receive the Lord's Supper. That's point number one. Point number two is a personal preparation needs to take place, meaning that we have to ask ourselves some questions. Do I understand that I have sinned? Do I recognize that I am a sinful person? I'm a sinner. Do I believe and trust that Jesus has cleansed me of every last one of my sins, that the cross and the blood Jesus shed there has won for me a completely clean record in the eyes of God and that I I have a fresh start in Jesus Christ. Do I believe that? And so when we approach the Lord's table, what Paul and Jesus and others teach us is our heart should be in this place of I recognize that I'm sinful and at the very same time, I am absolutely confident that I am forgiven fully and freely. All right, so write this down. The Lord's Supper is a sacred act. We treat it that way by receiving it as Christ's true body and blood and by receiving it with a repentant, that is a sorrowful but faith-filled heart. Flip the page. Paul was facing an issue with the Corinthians. And, and, and the issue with the Corinthians was very much selfish, individualistic thinking. And and an example of this was communion itself. So let me give you a little historical context that many of you may not realize about how communion was originally handled. Now, it didn't look exactly like it looks today because Here at Crosswalk, for example, as I said, at 10.30 and 12.30, you come back in and we have a little worship service for communion. But but in the apostles' day, when the church first began, they would have church and then they would have what was called an agape feast or a fellowship meal after church was over. Now remember, these were smaller churches, most of them house churches, so the the size that we are would far outpace the size of most churches that Paul was writing to, typically 50 to 75 people. And after they had their church service, they would sit down and have a meal. 
Due to the Corinthians selfishness and individualism, what you had happening, Paul describes in Corinthians, is you had a bunch of wealthy people sitting over here on this side of the house and in this room gorging themselves on all the stuff they had brought for the potluck because they had the money to buy it. And then you had poor Christians sitting over here in a corner munching on a, a saltine cracker that they had managed to muster up and trying not to hungrily steal glances over there at the wealthy people who were refusing to share. And, and Paul tees off on this. <laughs> He's like, you, you're going to come to something we call communion and, and claim that you're getting reconnected to God and to each other and meanwhile do all of that in the context of this blatant selfishness? and uncaring lack of love, I think most of you know, or maybe know, that 1 Corinthians 13, this same book, the same letter, is where Paul talks in such beautiful poetry about love. Do you know why he talks so beautifully about love? Because the Corinthians had to hear about love. And they needed to hear about it in very profound terms because they were acting very unlovingly toward each other and toward members of their community as well. So, so look at what Paul says, top of page two in your notes. I have the right to do anything, you say. But let me just throw this in the hopper. Not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything. But let's remember, not everything is constructive. No one should seek their own good, but the good of others. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all, not for the glory of your self, but for the glory of God. Now this is right in context with Paul talking uh, about the Lord's Supper. And, and what he's saying is, God gave you this to be an extreme blessing to you, to, not for you to come and do something obedient to him, but for God to come into your heart, your mind, and do something amazingly gracious and powerful for you. Now, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say that again because that might be a perspective change for you. When the Bible talks about communion, Far more than referencing communion as a time where I come forward to offer myself up to God and re-consecrate, the Bible talks about Holy Communion as a time for God to offer himself and his blessings of forgiveness, the power to lead a new life, and gift you with eternal salvation. That actually, it's the reverse. God is bringing himself down to your level. And giving you a moment to receive these amazing blessings and this amazing power from him and to commune directly with him by taking in Christ's true body and blood. And not only to commune with him, but also supernaturally and mysteriously and spiritually to be in communion. That's why we call it Holy Communion with your brothers and sisters in Christ. That's the meaning of the Lord's Supper and Holy Communion. It is not about individualism. So do you see why Paul, Paul goes directly for the jugular of this issue of individualism and selfishness? Because he's basically saying, this is communion. This is about us coming together and us being given an opportunity to have God commune with us and, and, and you're being individualistic, selfish, and trying to just hold all the blessings for yourself. It's not about that. It's not beneficial, as he says here. It's not constructive to think of it this way. You see, this is a beautiful blessing and it's intended for you. But not if we, not if we receive it selfishly. That being said, if we receive it in the right spirit, unselfishly, unselfishly, look at what Jesus says. 
Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Beautiful gospel. Come to me, Jesus says. Believe in me. Trust in me. Come to me in holy communion. Come to me in baptism. And spiritually, you will never be hungry or thirsty again. You will know about the forgiveness I have for you. You will know about the power of a new life I want you to have. You'll know about a home in heaven that right now I'm preparing for you. Come to me. What's so interesting is that when Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, and if you flip the page back over, I want to take you back to the top of that initial passage, and I want to point out some words. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is, will you underline these words, for you. I, I want you to benefit from this. And then I want you to underline these words. These are the important words here. Do this. Do this. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do you see it again? Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Now, let me quickly hit on this point. How are we today kind of subject a little bit to the spirit of individualism and selfishness? I'll tell you right here at Crosswalk, it can happen when we, for example, if, if, if we would come into this church and say, um, I don't think I should have to go through your 101 and 201 class. I'm a Christian. I've been a Christian a long time. Who are you to tell me to stay away from the Lord's Supper just because I haven't done your 101 or 201 class? I know who I am. Now, what I'm gonna tell you is, there's a part of me that understands where you're coming from, so I, I get it a little bit, but there's a part of me that says, is that not saying no matter what my brothers and sisters in this church are about, I should have my way? And recognizing that, for example, this church is, this whole vision is built around being a church for unchurched people. One of the reasons that we have for wanting you, even if you're a long-term Christian, to go through 101 and 201 classes so that when you do bring a friend and when they do get interested in our church, and if it's a person that's not a Christian and needs to go through 101 and 201, you can say to them, I've been there, I've done it, it's a great class. I want you to go because you're going to learn a lot in that class. And in fact, I'll go with you. Because you will have that spirit of sharing and community. And, and that is so important. You know what I find so striking sometimes is that people who come from a non-Christian background don't even want to come to the Lord's table until they've taken 101 and 201 class. And I've heard this repeatedly. They say to me, Pastor, I don't want to do that, not understanding what I'm doing. I don't want you putting words or actions in my mouth. Let me learn first. Let me understand first. And then if I agree with what you're teaching and saying, then I'll come to the Lord's Supper. And I think that's beautiful. And what I, what I want to encourage today is that all of us would have that spirit, that we're doing this Christianity thing together and that even as a veteran Christian, if you have to back up and take spring training, that you're like, yeah, I might be a professional baseball player, but once a year, I still go back to spring training. I might be a long-term Christian, but Crosswalk is acting me to go back to 101 and 201 and take the basics again. And I'm good with that because the basics are always useful and helpful. And besides, it will help me understand whether I want to receive communion in this church. If I understand it the same way they do, and if I am truly standing up there, one in Christ with these people. So I want to encourage you on that. Because... 
I know sometimes people get a little confused of why can't we come to the Lord's Supper without going through all the rigmarole of the 101 and 201 class. It is because it is a holy thing and it is because God calls on us to understand it and be in agreement on it. All right, let's keep going. The Lord's Supper was established by Christ for my use. So just teeing back off a little bit on the thought I just concluded, if you are a person that's been here for a while and you haven't taken 101 and 201 class, take it. Because Jesus says, do this. He wants you to use it. Get into 101 and 201, understand what we teach about the Lord's Supper, and do this in remembrance of him. I'm going to say one other thing, and then I'm going to move on. If you're a person who's already gone through 101 and 201, and you have prepared yourself, and you understand it, and yet it's kind of long time between the times you receive the Lord's Supper, I want you to think through that. Because what the scriptures are teaching us today is this is one of the main three ways God uses to strengthen you. And, and yeah, it's true, you can get strength from reading the scriptures, but God gave us this very powerful sacrament to strengthen our faith. Jesus says, do this to you also. And examine your heart to see if it's a spirit of individualism in you that says, I can do it when I feel like doing it, and when I don't feel like doing it, I don't have to do it. I really think Christ wants to notch it up a little bit and say to you, do this, use this sacrament, receive its blessings as often as you can because it's going to help you and strengthen you. All right? We're moving on to the next passage. 1 Corinthians 10, 16 says this, is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? What this passage is pointing out is what I tackled at the very beginning, and we can hit this point because we've kind of already hit it a couple times in this message. For those of you who have always in your mind separated the physical and the spiritual into two completely different compartments, what I'm going to tell you is that God does something amazing and surprising in Holy Communion as he does in baptism. He takes spiritual heavenly blessings like forgiveness, spiritual power, a new life, eternal life, and he wraps them in a physical element like water or bread and wine. So often in our minds, we think if I want to get spiritually strong, that has nothing to do with anything physical. And what God is telling us with the sacraments is I've combined them. And there's a powerful reason why he's combined the physical and the tangible, the earthly, with the spiritual and the heavenly. And the reason is when God created you and me, he created you physical. He made you a material being. And he knows that you relate to relationships and love in that way. Do you know the five love languages? Have you ever heard them? I won't go through all of them. But there's a whole book written about how to tell other people that you love them in their language. And it says that for some people, you tell them you love them with words so that they can hear them. That's a sense. With some people, you give them a tangible physical gift or token, and that's what says, I love you. With others, you spend tangible quality time with them, and with still others, you put an arm around them. You hug them, you kiss them. Your touch tells them that you love them. Your physical, tangible touch tells them that you care about them. God knows this because he created us this way. And so when he wraps the, the spiritual blessings in water or in bread or wine, he's simply saying, I understand you, I get you, and I want you to get me and my heart. I want you to literally taste my love for you. And that's what he says in Psalm 34, 8. Taste and see that the Lord is good. 
See, that's what communion allows us to do. To remember how good God is using the sense of taste. And blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. It is God's powerful reminder and conveyance of these blessings cloaked in these physical elements. Write this down. The Lord's Supper uses the earthly elements of bread and wine so that I can taste God's goodness. And finally, this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. When Jesus established this sacrament, he said, when you come to this sacrament, you are going to receive my forgiveness. The forgiveness I won for you at the cross the forgiveness I conveyed to you through the empty tomb, when you come to this sacrament, you receive these spiritual blessings. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And what are those spiritual blessings? Let's look at Romans 6. But now that you have been, and I want you to underline these words, set free from sin and have become Slaves of God, you now have a whole new life with a whole new owner. The benefit you reap leads to holiness. God is changing your heart and your mind. And the result is eternal life. He is changing your eternal trajectory. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. God is doing all of this, conveying all these blessings to you as his free gift to you. Why should you come to the Lord's Supper? Why do this as Christ commands? Mainly because all these blessings are here for you. And I, and I, I want to strongly encourage you today to know that God wants each and every one of you to have these blessings I've just run through in Romans 6. And I want you to write this down. The Lord's Supper conveys heavenly blessings to me. So brothers and sisters, I, I know that today I may have challenged some thinking. And I, I, once again, I want to invite you to come forward if I've, if I've raised any questions in your mind about this because I want you to be crystal clear on what the Lord's Supper is. But understand this, most of all out of this message today, I want to encourage you strongly, prepare yourself through our 101 and 201 class to come to the Lord's table. And then once you are prepared through our 101 and 201 class, start coming often and regularly so that you can receive these powerful spiritual blessings that your loving God wants you to have. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you so much that you have determined to bless us spiritually in so many different ways. You give us your word so that we can read and understand and, and, and digest inwardly the message of the gospel that you have for us. You give us baptism to show us that you have washed us clean of our sins. You give us the Lord's Supper so that we can literally taste your goodness and your forgiveness to us. Lord, I pray that through your Spirit's power, you would motivate every heart and mind in this, in this room to understand that this is a sacred and holy moment when we are allowed to come in communion with you. But not to shy away from it, but, but rather to be drawn and attracted to it for its many spiritual blessings. And whatever next step each individual in this room needs to take to, to come to and access the Lord's Supper here at Crosswalk Church. Lord, through your Spirit's power, motivate the people in this room to take that next step because you want all of us to experience those blessings. Lord, I lift up this prayer to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Take a moment.